and they began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. You just heard the praises of God proclaimed in other languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Hindi, Indonesian, Zulu, and Mandarin China, Chinese. We just experienced a little bit of what the people of Pentecost experienced, the proclamation of the truth of God in other languages. Now, who were these people who were filled with the Holy Spirit and had tongues of fire resting on their head? When you back up a little bit and act, you find out it's not just the twelve. When you back up a little bit and actually find out there are 120 people, 120 of the disciples of Jesus. They were his inner 12, minus Judas, plus Matthias, his brothers, his mother, Mary, his friends, and those who followed him. There was a relatively small number of people. These were the unknowns, the Joe and Jane averages, who made their livings with their hands, or were, in cases like Mary, dependent upon those to take care of them and meet their daily needs. They were people you probably wouldn't give a second glance to if you saw on the street. They were the factory workers, the store clerks, the waiters, the waitresses, the, the farmers of today. That's who these people were. And they were the ones used by the Holy Spirit to turn the world upside down for Jesus. They were the ones chosen by the Holy Spirit to go out, starting in their own backyards, with the message of the gospel of Jesus and speaking that message into their culture. They were the ones who took the Great Commission to heart. Go into all of the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. They taught about Jesus' love, about his sacrifice to save them from eternal death. They taught about his commands and taught people to obey them, and they weren't shy to exclaim and to proclaim what they knew. They weren't afraid to speak the name of Jesus into their culture. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach out and do great things for the next generation, to change the world one life at a time by the power of Jesus' name. And here's the thing, so are you, so am I. We have the same Holy Spirit, they did. And this is where we left off in our message last week, if you were here last week. The same Holy Spirit that was poured out on Pentecost is the same Holy Spirit that's been poured out on you and me in our baptisms. The same power to proclaim the gospel message, to tell people about Jesus, and to teach them to obey everything he has commanded and everything he has said, both in his three years of his earthly ministry and what he has caused to be written all throughout Scripture in his Bible, that same power has been given to you and me. And you know what strikes me? I realize this is a holiday weekend. Many people are on vacation. I understand that. But throughout our services this weekend, there will be roughly the same number of people here at Trinity St. James as there was in that upper room of Pentecost. We here today are comprised of men and women, older and younger, some with more resources, some with less resources. Some with more education, some with lesser education. Some of you are amazing craftsmen and women. Craftsmen and women. You can do things that I can't even imagine. I have seen some of what you have produced. Some of you can do things with hammer and saw and nail that I can only dream about. Some of you here today are incredibly intelligent. And you could give a Microsoft certified engineer a run for their money when it comes to working with computers. Moms and dads, grandpas, grandmas, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, cousins, all gathered here today, and everyone, no matter who we are, have been touched by the Holy Spirit and released into the world to turn it upside down, to speak into our culture in the name of Jesus. Sounds great. How do we do it? What does this mean for us tomorrow? It means surrender. It means getting out of the way. It means letting the Holy Spirit in and letting him have his way with us. It means we stop telling God what we think his word says. and start just listening to what God says. It means letting God have his way even if we don't like it. Even if we don't agree with it. It means knowing God's word so we know what his way is. It means being the people of God right where he's placed us. 
It means being his hands and his feet. It means wearing our faith on our sleeves with our lives, our attitudes, and our love. It means going to them, talking to those people, intentionally being friends with that group. It means loving like Jesus loved and not being ashamed of it. It means not being ashamed to speak the name of Jesus right into our culture, right into our backyards, right into the world where he has placed us. That's what it means. It means remembering our baptisms and the faith and the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It means asking to be renewed over and over and over again with the power of the Holy Spirit and then turn loose in the world with his words, his life-changing power, his touch for those around us. And how do we know that's true? How do you know I'm not just making all this up right now? Jesus himself said it in our gospel reading. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come. He came at Pentecost, and that changed everything. He came at our baptisms, and that changed us from orphans to redeemed, adopted children. But we don't get to stay there. Remember the Dead Sea? Remember the Dead Sea? What makes the Dead Sea dead? It's not the quality of water that flows into the Dead Sea that makes it dead. It's the quantity that flows out. If you think, because I know we're all intimately familiar with Middle Eastern geography, so if you think about the Middle East right now, you've got the Sea of Galilee to the north. The Jordan River comes off that. There's streams and creeks that feed into the Jordan River, and all of that empties into the Dead Sea. It all travels south. And that's where it stays. What makes the Dead Sea dead? What makes the Dead Sea so there's no life in it? And it, it just reeks. The Dead Sea smells bad because of death and decay that's there. As if there's no outlet. The Dead Sea just takes and takes and takes and takes and takes, but it doesn't do anything with it. If there was just an opening in the Dead Sea, if there was just an outlet, then the water could continue to flow through and the Dead Sea would become alive and have living water in it. But because it just takes and takes and takes and doesn't give, it remains without life. It remains without any hope for life. It remains dead. There's a lot of people that are just like that. We take and we take and we take and we take the gospel message over and over and over again. And, and, and it brings joy and we stake our lives on it. We rejoice in the cross of Christ and in the empty tomb and we believe it. And we receive it, we take it, we take it, we take it, and then we don't do anything with it. We don't do anything with it. We've been adopted. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit already. It's not like we have to go out and find the Holy Spirit and invite him to come into our lives. He's already here. He's already come. The question now is, what do we do? We just respond to what he's done. We spend time in his word, the word that he caused to be written, so we can learn more about this overwhelming, mind-blowing, go to the end of the earth to show us how much he loves us, love that the Father has for us. Holy Spirit's come. He's already come. The promised Holy Spirit by Jesus has already arrived. He came at Pentecost, he came to your baptisms, and he's here today, right now. He gives life and faith, and he, he sanctifies us. And Jesus' sanctification is one of those churchy words. Big word we use all the time, but what in the world does it mean? Sanctification literally means to grow us up, is what it literally means, to mature us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, he matures us, he grows us up in Jesus. But if we just stop at that point, then we're nothing more, much more than individual dead seas. A lot of good stuff coming in, but not going anywhere. And the consequences of that are others who don't get the benefit of what we've been given. In our own slow demise, as all that living water we have pouring into us, just sits and stagnates. 120 ordinary people. 120 Joe and Jane averages that turn the world upside down by the Holy Spirit poured out them on Pentecost. And it started in their own backyards. Jesus said, You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. It starts right in our own backyards. We talked about this last week, too. Again, if you were here, remember the map that we put up. It starts in our own backyards. So here's the question. Here's the question nobody likes, but it's a question we all have to answer. 
Where is your Jerusalem, you Holy Spirit-filled Christian? Where is your Jerusalem? 120 ordinary people. 120 factory workers, store clerks, farmers, waiters, waitresses. 120 people who knew Jesus and couldn't keep the news to themselves. 120 people. 120 men, women, and children who were filled with the Holy Spirit in the ordinary morning when they gathered for worship. 120 people released into their hometowns, their own places of work, their own social circles. 120 people touched with the power of the Holy Spirit, not caring what others would think of them for speaking the name of Jesus. 120 people singing praises, praying, being responsive and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. 120 people. Just about the number we're going to have here this weekend. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, here we are. Here we are, and we're already filled with you. Here we are gathered by your power this morning, brought into worship this morning by you, given faith by you. Here we are. Move among your people again today. Come in and take over. Refill us again today and make us to be the people you want us to be. Forgive us for getting in the way. Forgive us for putting our thoughts and feelings and ahead of your life giving instructions and what you wrote, what you inspired to be written and put together in the Bible. Forgive us for forgiving what Luther taught us. We are little Christs to our world. Touch us like you did our ancestors so long ago. Strip away all the things that get in the way. Come in and take over. And bring us to be the next 120 people used by you. Move in us today in a very powerful way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.